Hello and welcome to the Vinny Brusco Show podcast, episode number 418. This week's episode, I'm joined by Bobby Sausalito. Bobby is a former full-time web designer and was making social commentary videos on Instagram and IGTV and out of nowhere, one of them just took off and Bobby has shifted gears from web design to becoming a full-time online presence, social commentator, and basically his spin on what's going on in the world today. And he has shifted gears to taking that mindful approach to life and bring it into a very humorous but potent and powerful message. And Bobby's video of him on the Bradley Dropping Bombs podcast was shared to me by a buddy, Billy. And once I saw that video, I realized Bobby operates on that higher level of thinking. He operates on a higher frequency. And his epiphany that he had during a psilocybin mushroom trip and the realization that we are all God is the story of the alchemist, one of the oldest stories ever told, the realization of your own potential. And he brings that awareness to his videos and to his commentary and to his presence online. And it was an awesome time talking to Bobby about you know mindfulness and his approach to comedy and that shift that actually transpired and how scary it was and what it was like and his online t-shirt company and the power of a t-shirt and so much more. So I hope you enjoy episode number 418 with Bobby Sausalito. Enjoy. This is Bobby Sausalito and this is the Vinny Brusco Show. And here we go. I like your setup. You got a lot of monitors there. A lot of monitors. That's just the computer that I don't use. I have four in front of me. <laughs> Literally. Do you really? Yeah, I have four in front of me, yeah. Why do you have so many monitors? I'm a web developer. Ah, okay. So I have um, I have the setup of, I've got the big one right here, one to the left, and then I got a stack of two right here. And then this was my employee computer, kind of like the backup in case anything was to go awry. Um, right. And after I, after I got rid of all of my in-house employees, um, I just keep it as a backup in case this one goes down basically yeah that's that seems like a lot i am not uh tech savvy at all yes so i i've been a web developer since i was like geez i don't even know i want to say like 13 is when i first started building sites 18 is when i started doing it for money for other people so it's i've taken it very seriously and run the web development business for for many years and that's kind of gotten me to here and interestingly enough um those skills ended up paying off big time because it allowed me to kind of pursue this project and really make, um, really make the most of it because I had all these web skills and i made the right investments. And in the event that everything was to go to hell, I could always kind of like fall back on, on that skill if I had to. Yeah. It's like having a trade, right? It's like having something that, you know, you can fall back on and make a, a certain amount of money and, and be set. Yeah. I should close these blinds. So there's not so much light. Don't worry about it. You're in Florida, right? Yeah. There you go. That's a little, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it's not so, no, so bright. There you go. So my, my buddy Billy sent me your your podcast appearance on Dropping Bombs with Bradley, and he sent me the snip of you and your psilocybin experience, which I want to get into. But first, I want to ask you, how did you get into from, from programming and web design? How did you get from that into kind of this social media presence and comedy? Well, I, I started... Um, I started building, I started building websites and, and I understood the value of social media for many, many years. And I had done it for clients and I had done ad campaigns and a variety of other things. So I always knew the value of it and where it could take you. But as good as I was at building websites and creating online experiences, I didn't know how to, how to get an account to really, really grow. I, it's like, I was just like, you know what? In the social media world, unless I'm living, sleeping, eating and breathing it, I really don't know my way around as much as, as much as somebody that like is in it 24 seven. So I just kept leaning into my web development stuff. Cause that's where I had the advantage. Um, but I made an Instagram account for myself personally and just started shooting funny videos just to kind of like vent my frustrations about politics because none of my friends here locally cared about that stuff. So I was like, I gotta say this to somebody. I gotta put it on the, <laughs> Somebody it, listen to me. Yeah. I was like, I gotta put it on the record. So I just started yelling into my phone as a way of kind of venting frustration. And then I just happened to have a video go viral back in August. And I just thought to myself, like, 
you know, my, my account's picking up followers like crazy. I'm getting a ton of views. This is more views than I ever would have thought I could have gotten this fast. I was like, let me see if I could do it again. So I made a second video and that one went kind of nuclear as well. So I was like, I'm going to make a video every day until the election and see what happens. And if at the end of the election, everything goes out to hell, then I'll build websites. Um, and I just managed to, the election came and went, it was up in the air. I was like, all right, now I'll go to the sixth. So I went to the sixth. <laughs> you keep on setting it a little bit further out. Yeah. And then after the sixth, I was like, wait, this is still inconclusive. The riots, all these other things to talk about. Then I was like, I'll go till the 20th, see what happens. Went to the 20th. And then I'm like, this is insane. Joe actually did get in. Now we've got, now everybody's like looking for somewhere to go. So I was like, let me just keep going and see if I can make it happen. And like, here we are in March. And I just did that huge podcast with Brad. I did really F with Andy Priscilla and like, um, my account's still continuing to grow and people seem to be liking what I'm saying. So I just, I'm just loving doing it. And if I could do this for a career for the rest of my life, I would love to do that. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. It, it takes a certain shift, but like always having that, that it's a balance, right? It's like anything else in the world. It's having a balance, but like kind of setting that line, like, all right, well, well, you know, this time, let me, let me try to like, wait, we'll, we'll, we'll push the date back to here. We'll push it back to here. Cause like, do you think that was something that you just weren't believing kind of what was transpiring or was it just kind of like, all right, I just, I'm not ready to dive into this. No, I think it was just more, it was more along the lines of like, I, I, I treating it, let, put it this way. I built, I've been building one to three websites, new websites and doing web development work every month for the last 13 years. I've built a new website or whatever else. In August, when it, when it, when the first two videos went off, I just had to decide like, Am I going to make this my full-time job? Because it takes a lot of time to shoot the videos, edit the videos, post them, think of the content, make the jokes, then comment, reply, DM, all the other stuff, edit it, put it on Facebook. It takes like real time. So what I realized was like, I can't really successfully do both. It's like too hard. So I was like, I'm going to put my full attention into this because I know that that's how things grow is when you focus on a single thing. So I was like, so the decision to go full out, full on had not necessarily a deadline, but like a temporary deadline where it was like, it makes sense to go to this point and see. So it was like, I'll go to the election and I'll just, I'm only going to think that far. I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself. I'm just going to give it everything I got until the election and see. Um, and then all of these other things transpired. I always believed that it could work, but I wasn't sure how quickly I'd be able to monetize it to a point where I'd be able to only do this because it's like, I was making pretty good money building websites and doing my web work, but it wasn't like fulfilling. It didn't have that. It didn't use my magic. Like I love doing it, but um, it wasn't like, like there was parts of it that seemed like work. And this to me, almost none of it seems like work. Like I'm doing it for fun. Um, so I was putting those deadlines as just a way of saying, I won't build websites till then. I'll give it my full attention. Let's see what happens. And that was kind of what it was. I didn't really think I was going to stop. I just in my mind said, this is a this is a reasonable deadline to stop like going 24 seven. Cause when I'm when I tell you that like from August till till January or till November 4th or 3rd or whatever it was, I did literally nothing but think about how to grow that account. I didn't think about client work. I didn't think about website work. I didn't think about even my life. I was like, Friday night, I'm going to work. Saturday night, I'm going to work. Like, I was like, I'm gonna, let me use this quarantine to just press it all in and see what can ha happen from it. Um, I'd be at the gym respond, replying to DMs and, and um, replying to comments and just doing everything I possibly could, gathering up intel. So I was like, it's unsustainable to go that hard at something, but I'll do it for 90 days until it's you know, until I can see what really happened. And now that, now that we're through all that, I've taken a little bit of the pressure off myself to be like relentlessly, no, you know, no, like no sleep, no nothing. And now I'm more finding a balance because I believe that it has some real sustainability. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's leaning into the thing that you want to be doing. Right. And, and anytime you're kind of taking that leap of faith and you, you're kind of kind of stepping out of the comfort zone and stepping out of what you know and what you've been in for 13 years and you step into this new arena, this new platform, which call for what it is, it's a very saturated market for, for lack of a better term. Sure. Um, and, and yes, it is a full-time job to post, to do this. Like I, I do it on a very minimal scale and I'm like, this is a lot of fucking work. Like this is why people have VAs and they have all these, all these outsource, all these things. And that's something I got from Steven Pressfield in his, uh, the war of art is pros hire pros. Like you can't do it all and you have to use your bandwidth accordingly. Yep.
No, that's absolutely right. It's, it, it really is. It's a full-time job. The thing is, is that like, like any business, it's like, if you see great upside reward as a result of you putting that time and attention in, that's why people do it. In this particular case, this, it's like the dream job. It's like work from home, do whatever you want, work from anywhere, do something that you, that's fun and is passionate, make people laugh, get the social interactions of it all and, and, and all that upside. That's great. So it's like, it has such a macro impact to not only your life, but, but even the world at large, it like has all of the pieces. Whereas like when I built websites, I would work really hard to sell somebody a $10,000 website. Then I'd have to go build the website. Then I'd have to launch it and communicate. And then set. it's like, it was always topped out. Whereas I could make a video right now, the same way that I could make a video five years from now. And it could take me a similar amount of time, but it could make 500 times as much return. And that's kind of the thing is like with a website, I was never going to sell a website for Five hundred thousand dollars. That was that was not fifty times the size of the, you know, of the ten thousand dollar website or whatever. So I just kind of understood that that was the case, and um, it just was like a whole lot of work and not as much reward, not as much reciprocal reward. Um, so I just was like, this is such a this has so much more macro impact to my life, my social life, my purpose, my legend, and then and then also the upside of the upside financially later on because this can reach the world. No matter how many websites I build, it's like. No one from Australia is going to Venmo me $20 at one o'clock in the morning watching my live stream. And that, right. stuff happen, and that stuff happens now. That's cool. When you, when you had that first video go viral and you, you had kind of mentioned like, was this a one-time thing? What was that? What was that like? Like, what was that kind of like, what was it like waking up to that? You know, it's interesting. I posted it at like probably four or five o'clock and I was sitting right here, I was building a website and I was listening to Luke from wearechange.org. And he was talking about how Bill de Blasio's wife was spending $3 million a year on cookies, on videos, making cookies and stuff to make videos for YouTube. And I was like, that is hilarious. So I just made the video. I thought it was funny, funnier than any of the ones I'd ever done, but I didn't really think much of it. I started getting like a disproportionate amount of DMs from my friends. Like, yo, that was hilarious. That's the funniest thing I've seen. So I was like, all right, let me make a video out of it. I, I had literally just posted it to my story and didn't even think much of it. And a bunch of people were DMing me laughing and stuff like that. So I made it into a story post. And then I put it up on the story. And again, just like got back to work. A couple hours later, I noticed that it had like four or 500 views. And most of my videos, it would take, they would get 250, maybe 300 after the first couple of weeks. Like that's where they topped out. And I had 400 in like a couple hours. And I remember just thinking to myself like, wow, that's, that's kind of amazing. So i posted it again. And I said, share this. Like, I never asked you to share, do me a solid and just share this one. And people started sharing it, posting it up to their story. And by later that night, I think it had like 1500 or 1800, which I thought was amazing. The next morning I woke up again, not really thinking much of it. And somebody had texted me and said, yo, your video got featured on Barstool. And I woke up and I was like, whoa, like, oh my God. <laughs> so I went on Barstool and I was like, all the Barstools. And I, and I didn't see it anywhere. I swear to God, and I messaged the kid back. I'm like, where dude he's like oh my bad bro like i was wrong it was, it was something else and i was like ah so then i just i didn't think much of it i looked at my video and it had like had like almost i think it had almost eighteen thousand or twenty thousand views by the morning and i'm like holy shit what happened and i started asking people that were dming me where did you find it and they said wake up with linda posted it um and she had a private account so i couldn't see it so i followed her and just had to wait until she accepted me and then by the end of the day that day, it was at like over 30,000. And I noticed that some other bigger accounts had been reposting it. And they weren't tagging me. They were just reposting it to their story. And one of the big accounts that reposted it was Andy Frisella. He has 1.7 million followers. And I started picking up followers like crazy. Um, Tommy Vex from Bad Wolves uh, reposted it as well. And a couple of other really, really big accounts shared it. And then it just started snowballing. And by, by that time, the next day, it had almost 55,000, 60,000. Yeah, that's got to be kind of a. Like, it, it, I, I'm thinking of that scene in in um, in Blow when they're when they're uh, heating up the coke, and he's like, "Fuck me, running 150!" Like, yeah. All of a sudden, it takes that next step. You're like, "What the fuck is going on right now?" Yeah, and the thing was too is I was picking up so many followers. It's like, I, I never thought that. It's weird. It's like of all the social media I ever did, I never understood how virality like really worked and how quickly it snowballs. What I've realized is like, you have a 48 hour window of virality. When something goes out, it has two days to just cook. And that's kind of like the, the half-life of it. And um, just watching it, like one person shares and another person shares and it just like picks up steam. Um, it was really, it was really incredible to watch. But again, it's like, 
after the after the first day of watching it, I'm like, I'm like, is this a one off? Like, am I a one hit? You know, am I a one hit wonder? Like, could I could I do it again? So the pressure to make another one that was on that caliber was like immense weighing on my mind. I'm like, oh no, like I got one chance, you know, like I'm hot right now. Can I hit two? Um, so the pressure to make that second one was really hard, but a lot of the big accounts that had reposted the first one reposted that one and that one took off and I was like, all right, I really got something here. Now I'm gonna like really lean into it. But even if you got the one hit wonder and you're the four non blondes, it's not a bad way to go. Like that's not, that, listen, that's not bad to alleviate the pressure to do the next one right because you don't want to go into that one like gripping the bat so tight we're like i gotta hit this ball and then all of a sudden you know it's a big swing and a miss potentially i just felt like i felt like it's kind of like that it's like uh it's like that movie eight mile with eminem where it's like yeah <laughs> it's like you got one shot i seriously i felt that way and i don't mean that way like if i didn't do it, it you know my life's over but i meant like if i was to ever, if i was to ever make this work like i really got a hit on this second one like i gotta I got to show somebody that I have the capacity to do it twice, show myself. And then I was like, I don't care if the next one gets one tenth of the views. I'll keep going because I'll know that I can reduplicate the magic again. It wasn't just like, it just so happened to be, it's like, it wasn't a fluke. It's like, if I could do it twice, I could do it 2000 times is kind of how I felt. Exactly. If you can get one view, then you can get, there's nothing to say you can't get a million views. You make $1 off of the thing. There's no saying you can't make a million dollars off of the thing, you yes. know? And, and, and I think a big part of that is the recognition and the awareness that you're, you're kind of stepping up to the plate in this moment. Right. And that's what kind of separates people in, in, in all honesty is when you have, when you are in the moment, a, do you recognize it and B you know, do you come through on the other end? Like, that's like a Derek Jeter thing, right? Like, it's like, here's the moment. And and a lot of people wait with bated breath or they let their thoughts or their emotions kind of get ahead of them. And then they can't perform in that moment where it's like, okay, it's here. My body's telling, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I'm nervous, I'm, I'm anxious. These are all great things. And I could use this energy in two ways. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was definitely one of those, one of those moments where it's like, your entire life's work kind of like culminates in this moment. But, you know, my high school football coach, he always said, he's like, there's no such thing as luck. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And like the reality of it was, is that I was, I was ready for it at that moment. It was in a, it was like the universe aligned and like as weird as it is, it's like, I, I talk about it all the time now is that, that things happen the way that they need to happen. That's how it's supposed to be. And there's been a lot of times in the past where I've been frustrated about one thing or the other not working out. And it's just like, you got to kind of just trust the plan. It always works out. And this moment that just so happened to line at the very right second, it was like, I was ready for it. I was prepared for it. I was ready to seize the opportunity when the, when the opportunity presented itself. I didn't know what it would be, but I knew it would come. And like, this is just so happened to be it. And I was like, there it is. Let's go. And yeah, it was just kind of like this instinctual, like animalistic instinct where you're just like, yep. I see it like I see it like a thousand miles away. And um, it was just it was because I had been ready for it and preparing. Not like I think there's some quote. I wish I knew it exactly. But it was something along the lines of like, if you're not ready when the opportunity comes, like it's already too late. Like you can't start preparing once you see the avenue. So the fact that I had been doing all of that legwork for many, many years beforehand um, allowed me to really seize it full on. Yeah, it's, it's a difference of being proactive or reactive, right? If you're going to yep. be if you're going to be ahead of the curveball and you're waiting on it, we're making a lot of baseball references for whatever reason. I have no idea why. But, uh, you know, if you're ahead of it and you know it's coming, then you, you're going to be in a better position to to strike right when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah. What were you like? What were you like? What led you into comedy? What were some of your influences? And like, what were you doing? What was the work up until that moment like? You know, the funny thing about it is that when I like when I made my business account, when I made my Instagram account from normal to business, it had, you had to choose something and you had to choose political figure or whatever else. And I was just like, what am I? And I'm like, I don't know, the, the funny comedian. I never made myself to be a comedian. I was like, I'm a comedian. I never really thought about it. I, I never saw myself I never really saw myself doing like stand up comedy. Like I didn't see myself on stage talking about, you know, dick and fart jokes or whatever else. And I love comedy, but I always thought that I had like some higher purpose. Not that comedy doesn't have a great purpose because it absolutely does, but I always fashioned myself to be more of a thought leader, motivational speaker. And I wasn't sure that comedy had its position in that realm. I always thought I'd be a, a Tony Robbins type. 
Um, but it's like when this stuff happened, it was like, I, I thought that I was funny, but I didn't think I was objectively funny. I didn't think I was funny in mass. I thought I was funny observationally, you know, in day-to-day -day life. I didn't think that I could quote unquote write jokes. But the reality is, is when I sit down to consume media, I would say 90% of the media that I consume is comedy based. Like there was years that the only channel I watched was Comedy Central. I watched stand up. I love going to comedy shows and like, I just consume a lot of comedy related content. And that's kind of where it all came from is it's just kind of like regurgitating all the things that I liked about all the comedians that I heard. I never really fashioned myself like I'm a comedian or I'm going to write jokes. And I, even now, I don't really feel like I even really write jokes that much. The reality is, is that the joke writes itself when the content is so ridiculous and they're creating it for me. It's like the joke writes itself and all I have to do is react as opposed to waking up in the morning and be like, I need to write something funny. I like go and find the news and then I react to the news and that's the humor. It's like, I don't, I don't feel the task of, of, of writing the joke, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, there's enough going on in the world to that. It's uh, they're serving it up on a silver platter for you. Now it's just about your own personal perspective on it and how you can articulate that. So you're mainly doing a lot of ad libbing and kind of a lot of just off the head stuff. Yeah. I mean, like I would say of, of all the videos that I do, I write probably less than, I would say less than, 2% of what I actually say in a video I write down, sometimes nothing at all. What I'll do is I'll just like certain times, if I'm making a comparison, if I'm like, if I see something and I'm like, that's like if I did blank, or that's like if such and such did such and such, I'll write down those things so that I can hit on things that really require thought. But most of it is just me reacting and going nuts. Like it's, it's all ad lib. And interestingly enough, I've tried a lot of different things along the way through this to try to figure out what's the secret sauce. And the things that I wrote down mapped out, planned, scripted, never did as well as the things of me just kind of ripping. So I just rip. And the thing, I think the real advantage of what I'm doing is that I shoot them in 15 second increments, sometimes 30 seconds. So I like shoot it, watch it, shoot it, watch it. And I'm always analyzing it incrementally throughout. It's not like I just turn it on and rip. It's like I do 15 seconds, I watch, I see if I laugh at it, and then I go to the next 15 seconds. So it's, it's like a, it's like a buildup. Yeah. And, and to your point earlier, like comedy, it's funny because like the, the, the jester of the court, right? The comedians could always comment on things that no one else could say, right? The jesters could always crack on the king where everyone else had to keep their mouth shut. And it's kind of weird where comedy has always been this social narrative of what's wrong and what's going on in the culture. And then you have people like George Carlin or Bill Hicks who, who did that to a, a, a very conscientious higher level thinking platform and level where most comedians can't step up to that level. Right. So it's, it's, it's to your point earlier. It's like, yes, you could be consciously aware of the social climate, but there's another level to it where you are Tony Robbins esque mindful approach to, to comedy, which is very yeah. different. Yeah. It's, that's one of the things that I think has been so magic is like when I first started being entrepreneurial, I remember thinking to myself, if something doesn't exist, it's like, it's like, it's like when you create like a, what, what's it called? A, um, a disruptor or disrupting technology. It's like, it either doesn't exist because there's no money in it or because nobody else is doing it, but you're not sure which one of those it is. So when I looked for something that was similar to me, I saw a Bill Hicks, I saw a George Carlin, but it was like, I never really fashioned myself to be as, as funny as them. I didn't think that I was, but the reality is a lot of what they were saying was just like factual based stuff and just right. kind of saying it in a funny way. So I, I didn't, I didn't see somebody else doing exactly this thing. And I was just like, all right, maybe it just, maybe that doesn't exist. But a lot of the kind of magic of all this stuff is that I haven't, I haven't really worried about more than what's right in front of me. I'm just like, taking it day by day. It's like, I make this video, it's funny, they react a certain way, I learn, I adapt, I move forward. I'm not like, I need to be X or it has to be perfect. I just do the best I can every day and then that's it. Well, that's a large part of any any process you go through is learning to, and and in, in Atomic Habits by James Clear, he talks about that, is, is just about, you know, getting involved in the, the, the mundane of it, right? For lack of a better term. And, yeah. and just showing up every day, showing up every day, no matter what is, whether it be the cold shower, the yoga, the breath work, the meditating, the podcast, the, the, the IGTV live, whatever it is you're passionate about, whatever it is you want to be doing, essentially, show up for it every single day. And 
over the course of time, it may take longer than others, that thing will happen. Yep. That yeah, thing will happen. Absolutely. For sure. No, that's that's the thing is like, it, all things kind of root back to like a couple core principles that I think the your entire life revolves around, which is just like ambition and drive, having having being happy just in general happy with what you're doing and and just and discipline just having the discipline to show up every day no matter what even even when you don't and to work really hard when you know that you need to and to work really hard when you don't really want to and it's like that's where the magic is is that if you if you can be relentless in your pursuit and have the discipline to keep showing up you can really do anything i think high school football really taught me that the most it's like and and sports really too because you work really hard and then you see it in practice. You see how sharp you are during the games. You see wins, you see touchdowns. You see these things that represent that your work is being done properly. And my high school football coach, he would always hammer us on mental toughness. He's like, it's raining, we're going to practice. You're tired, we're going to practice. He's like, we're gonna to go to the weight room every day. You're tired after practice. He would, he would rip us through practice the whole day. And at the end of practice, when we were exhausted, covered in mud, sweaty, wanting to die, we would go to the weight room and do squats. He would press our mind where it's like, you think you can't do this. No logical aspect of your brain would say, I'm freezing cold, I'm sweaty, I'm covered in mud and I'm, and I wanna pass out. Nothing in your mind would ever say, let's go to the weight room and do squats and lift right now. And not only let's lift, let's push it when we lift. And he said, this is the difference of how a team wins in the fourth quarter. If I get you guys to the fourth quarter, five minutes left and you don't have this mindset, this will, this toughness, we're going to lose in the last five minutes of the game. He's like, you have to push 100% all the way through. And that mental toughness education um, has proved extremely crucial in my life all the way through with everything that I do, where it's just like, you have to completely go or, you, or you'll lose in the last minute. It's not I over think, until it's over. Yeah. And I think for me personally, it's cr also creating those difficulties, right? Whether it be, like I said, a cold shower, jujitsu, or a yoga pose, or, or even just silence, right? Sitting in silence and meditating, you know, sensory deprivation, sitting in the silence and, and kind of navigating your thoughts, because that they will become your best friend and your worst enemy, right? They'll become the voices off in the brush. They're like, hey, Hey, Bobby, you, you, you don't have to do that. Or, yeah. you know, who are you to do this? Who are you to show up? You're not, you're not Bill Hicks. You're not George Carlin. Who, who are you to do this? Right. And yep. you'll get into that narrative. Right. And then that could also set you a completely different trajectory. But if you're able to set up these difficult tasks that ultimately teach you a lesson in your essence, maybe not in the actual tangible, but in the experience, now you have something to reference. So that when you're coming up against these trials and tribulations, you're able to go, oh, this is just like that other thing. It's just in this form. Yep. It, it's all, it, it all, every lesson that you learn in one aspect has applications in other. It's like, it's like life imitates nature, art imitates nature. It's like when you, when you like being, being in meeting Andy Frisella last week, one thing he always talks about is like, how, like how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. And it's just like, if you're not disciplined in all these other aspects of your life, what's to lead you to believe that you're suddenly going to be disciplined here. The reality is, is that you have to be disciplined all the way through all around all the time, every day now until forever. And that's the game. And it's like, you either have to you have to understand, digest, and and accept that to be true because it is. And until you until you do that, your you know your 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 potential is limited. It's like you got to be able to control your mind. You got to be, be able to control what you think about. You got to be able to do things that you don't want to do when you want when you don't want to do them. Um, and and again, just like you said, it's like it's like going to the weight room. It's like in the fourth quarter, in the last minute. If I think that I'm too tired to win this game, and then I remember that I just did a four hour practice last week and I was wanting to die, and I still managed to push out 50 squats at 300 pounds, like I could do this. And mental toughness, often, just like you said, it's like you can destroy yourself by, as Andy puts it, like letting your inner bitch voice dominate your mind. Yeah. And that, and that, that inner bitch voice comes to me. I mean, every morning, right. It's like, you don't gotta get up and work out. You don't have to just stay in bed. It's cozy. It's comfortable your body, but you, you, but it's your, it's your body's, you know, innate nature to want to be comfortable, right? Like sitting on the couch is it, it certainly beats hopping on the treadmill, right? It makes right. sense that I want to sit down and relax and not go running. You know, what were you like? I mean, was this something that you were like as a kid? Was this something that kind of developed over time? Like, were you always kind of in that, you know, artistic kind of mindset or, or what was it like? Well, you know? I, 
I always fashioned myself to be an artist. And it's funny, like when I was seven years old, my grandfather said, you know, you're going to be a comedian one day. He would always say that to me. And I was that's like, that's great. Yeah. He would say that. And I, I was just like, that's just grandpa saying that. You know, oh, never, grandpa. Yeah. Right. I just never, sitting in the rocking chair. You're not going to be a comedian, but like, okay, grandpa. Yeah. I never really thought much of it. And this is like when I was really young. And then, you know, if you asked me when I was eight, nine years old, it was like, I'm going to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor. I thought that was so cool. Like, be an actor. What a great, what a great aspiration. As I got, as I got older, I started to realize that it's kind of like saying, I want to be, you know, I want to be, uh, I want to be an NBA superstar. It's like, you start to realize probabilities and the probability of something coming true. And you kind of have to plan a backup plan. And some people will say, just go all in and believe it. And maybe that's the case, but I was like, I need to make sure that I have something with a higher probability to fall back on in the event that this doesn't work. I don't want to be a starving artist my entire life. So I always thought I would be a creative. I loved art. I loved painting. I loved graphic design. I loved all these things, but I always stayed mindful that income, income streams and financial stability needed to be part of my focus. And that I couldn't just leave it up to the universe. Like I, I didn't, I didn't believe that I, I think about it and then a check comes in the mail, like um, the secret and things like that. So I just realized that like, I have to have some type of practical skill. And to me, business sales, the understanding of people, the psychology, the psychology of that, and just being a straight, just a hustler, um, always, always was something that I thought was like my fallback. My dad understood business. He taught me about business. Um, I felt like that was a fair fallback for my creative side. So I found a way to merge the creative and the business. And that was graphic design, internet work, and then ultimately web development, because I knew that I'd make a whole lot more money building websites than I would just being a designer, a graphic designer. So that was how the shift kind of became. And then as I learned about the internet, I kept thinking to myself, you know, if I ever wanted to be a comedian or an actor or a creative of whatever degree, the internet is the place that it's going to happen. I could see the future and know that that was where it was going to be, be a reality. Um, I just wasn't sure how to get there. Yeah. And I think, it's, it's fucked up. And it's, it's also kind of to your point where, you know, you get to a certain age and all of a sudden culture and influence and, and everything around you starts to creep into your, your mind. My daughter's six and I see it with her now where like the, the purity of her essence starts to get manipulated by culture and by school and even by her parents, right? Like she likes Star Wars, but I always say like, does she like Star Wars because she likes Star Wars or because I have a Boba Fett and an R2-D2 in here? Like, why does she like Star Wars? That's probably a combination of the two, but you see, you start to see that that purity kind of strip away by culture and by influence. And then the real world hits you and you're like, oh yeah, I got to pay bills and show up in this way. And, you know, it's hard to lean into either one of those, right? Because you don't, you, yes, the mentality or what they say is go all in on it, go all in on it, you know? And we kind of made that point earlier, but then there also is the reality to it all where it's like, yeah, I got to pay my bills. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's kind of the, un, it's kind of the unfortunate, the unfortunate reality of life, but you know, it's interesting. Like my, um, when my brother, my brother and I were going to college at the same time, and I'll never forget, he was a senior in college. I was in my sophomore year just starting. And he came back one day and he was like, bro, he's like, I wish I could unlearn all the stuff that they just taught me in college. He's like, your mind is still fresh. You still have that human instinct. You haven't been, you haven't been uh, tainted by this belief structure where you're forced to memorize all this stuff. He's like, I wish I could unlearn it and be back to my entrepreneurial mind, just like you have that creative freedom. He goes, when you go to college, they teach you how to be an employee, not how to be an employer. And he's like, they teach you how to fall in line and follow the rules and all this. He's like, I wish I could unlearn all that stuff. And, you know, that's kind of the thing is like, when I see everybody just generally adopting something, it reminds me like, maybe that's the opposite of what I should do. It's like, maybe I should take the path less traveled. Maybe there's more opportunity there. So I try to think about that all the time as I kind of navigate through. Yeah, but with social media, it feels like that path is not less traveled. It feels it's actually more traveled than than just the falling in line, right? Everyone everyone does have a podcast. Everyone does have an Instagram page. Uh, and there is something that's beautiful to that because it is all an expression of of themselves right yeah. um but then it also is like well who's gonna kind of work in the in the factories and who's gonna be the employee um but i agree with you i think college serves in like so many different ways you know obviously it shows that you can kind of kind of muster through something uh and unless you're a doctor or a lawyer and you need a specific skill i think it does teach you some some social and cultural things that are important but it's to your brother's point like you also 
there's nothing there for the most part on the uh, 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 on the grander scheme of things that's teaching how to be an individual. Yeah, yeah. They, that's see. That's the thing is when I went to college, I it's interesting. I thought I mean I was a I was a fairly good student. I wasn't the best student, but I did I did fairly well. And my senior year, I just kind of anticipated I was going to go to University of Connecticut. I was like, I'm going to apply there. I'm going to get in. I know other people that have got in. I'll get in. It'll be no problem. I have good enough grades to get into UConn. That'll be what I do. I applied to some other state schools as backups. And I was just like, whatever, I'm going to go to UConn. That year, the men's and women's basketball team both won the state championship. So the application or the, the national championship. So the applications for UConn stores, the main campus went up tremendously. As a result, I got in, but I got into the satellite campus, which was in, not in the not the main campus. So all that social element, all of the parts of college that I knew would be great development for me, I didn't get. It's like I wasn't living far away in a new place. I wasn't in a dorm. I wasn't in the mix, so to speak. So I went to the satellite school, and I and after the first year, I just remember being in there and being like. I'm better than this. I'm smarter than this. I don't see many people that, that see the world the way that I do. I feel like I'm in classes that are below my, my pay grade, so to speak. And I just didn't feel very stimulated. And by the time I went to my guidance, my counselor, I think at the end of the first year, and I asked her, or the beginning of the second year, I asked him or her, I can't even remember, like, what do I have to do to make sure that I can get up to stores to go to the business school? And he or she, I can't even remember, basically told me like, your grades are already not high enough to get into the business school, which means that if you graduate from UConn, you're going to graduate with an information and technology degree from this place. And I'm like, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Nobody's got that. And I immediately I was like, I'm out. I, I was like completely checked out. I'm like, I'm not going to go to this school and have a degree that no one's ever heard of. Um, it's like, I go to the business school or I'm out. And I, as soon as that happened, I checked out and, you know, I, to my parents' credit, they didn't threaten us. Like, they were like, we can't make you go. Like, we really want you to go. But you're an adult. Like, if this is what you're going to do, then, you know, we, we respect your decision. Like, we can't force you to go. And we're not going to keep paying the bills and have you just not go to class. Um, so to their credit, they they trusted my instinct and they let me do what I had to do. And um, I'm, I'm super thankful for that because it because it the, nothing will nothing will kick you in the ass. Like the day that you quit college and you go to yourself. Oh, I'm never going to learn again unless I make myself learn. Like, right. No books, no requirement, no deadline, no homework, no nothing ever again, ever. It's like the capacity of the to and the totality of my knowledge is capped right now. Right. <laughs> I was so like, what, what do I do from here? Yeah. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, all right, like now I got to figure it out. Like you wanted the challenge. Well, here it is. Asshole, it's like, here it's like yeah. time to go. And I just remember like thinking to myself at first how scary it was, but then just going, you know what? If I, if I believe that I have it, like I already did, I'll do anything. I put in 18 hour days figuring out how to build websites, how to monetize web development, how to learn how to make money online. I mean, I put in the work and I worked way harder than I ever did in college because it was like, I eat the wins, I eat the, I eat the failures. And I was, I was willing to take all or nothing. And I, and the other thing too, is like, I'm 19 or 20 or however old I was. And I just thought to myself, like, if I do something for the next 30 years, it's going to work. Like I'm 19 years old. Like right. I got, I got time. Like I'm smart enough that I can navigate my way. And here's the thing. I'm already broke. It's right. not like being an entrepreneur. They say you're broke for 10 years. Okay. I was like, I'm already broke anyways. So really where I'm broke, that's going to suck is 26 to 30. When other friends have good jobs and whatever else, I might be a little bit more broke than them. But I was like, but by the time I hit 30, maybe I'll have a million dollars. And like, that didn't end up being true, but I was certainly a lot further along by that point than a lot of my peers were that had a college degree. At least I felt that way. Well, it's, it's to the point of where you kind of jumped out early and you're like, all right, this isn't for me, but now I need to learn and adapt on my own where you can go through college and then you get the piece of paper that says, oh, you went through college, but now you have to learn and adapt on your own. You know, so you kind of just, like you said, if I, if I could kind of ration this out and negotiate this out in my brain and have it kind of make sense, I might be in a better position down the line. Was this experience after your psilocybin epiphany? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was um that was i think when i was i think i was probably 18 so yeah it would be after yeah um it was definitely in the as far as i can remember it was in the 
it was in the summer before my freshman year of college. And like, this wasn't the first time that I had ever eaten mushrooms. This was just the, this was just the time that I used it. This is the first time that it was purpose driven. Every time we had, every time I had eaten them with my friends, it was like me and my buddies laughing at a tree breathing right. or whatever. Melting, melting, right, right, right. Yeah, so this particular time, I just remember thinking to myself, like, you're at peak person right now. Like you're at peak life. You're like in a place that, you know, it's, it's funny. Like when you're 18 and 19, you watch movies and you talk to people that are like, man, those were the years. And you're like, how? I have no money. My car sucks. You know, like everything blows. Like I don't have any of this stuff that you have, but it makes an impression. As much as you don't want to admit it when you're young, you kind of are like, damn, they keep saying this. Like, I wonder if they're right. You know, like they say when you're see like going to prom, they're like, this is the time. And you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, I just remember thinking to myself, like, this is one of those unique moments in life. And one of the things that my brother was always good at was like identifying, identifying the significance of an individual moment. And I remember being like, all right, if I do this, this could be like a life tale. Like, when I'm 18, I went on a much I went on a trip and I ate mushrooms, kayaked to the center of the lake and solved my life's problems in one day. What a story that would be. Like, could I actually do that? So I literally set out to like write the book in reverse. Like look back when I'm 30 and say, this is what I did at 18. Like write that chapter. And even now as I move through life, I think about how will this be written in the book? Like when you make the decision, it's like, did you write some, did you do something that was worth writing about later or did you take the easier path? And it's just like, as I was writing the book of my life, I just remember thinking like, this could be a significant inflection point. And on top of all that, I knew that I had to come to grips with what this was. And I thought that being fully in tune with no outside influence and just being one with my mind would get me the answer. And it turned out that it did. And it's not that it got me the answer in the sense that it was like, build websites. It was just like, <laughs> it was just like, I just understood. I just understood that I had an un, I had a, we all have a remarkable power to control more than we think. And that if we just purely recognize and understand that power, um, then like, all things are malleable. And I just remember thinking like, this is the greatest thing. Like I would rather be nowhere in the universe, but here right now doing this right now, thinking this way. And then like, I was thinking about like my parents and my family and like my body and my face and like every single thing else. It's like, if I came back, would I be blonde and short or would I, be, you know what I mean? Like, what would I have done? And everything that I had done up until that point, I'm like, this is the coolest thing. Like if I could have picked it out of a hat or if I could have picked it off of a chart, this is how I would have done it. So I'm like, well, that means that I can control what happens in the future by simply checking the boxes in the direction that I want to go and being relentless in that pursuit. And on top of all that, now that I know that the world is this, is this malleable blob that I can control. And as for the most part, I was like, I have to certainly try to do that because anything that's not that is ignoring this revelation. Right. And, and it kind of becomes hard to ignore that, right? Like you can't yes. walk through the rest of your day to day knowing that. And, and you brought up the point earlier, the secret. And I think that that's where a lot of people get the idea of like, oh, you could sit on your couch and just wish for a million dollar check and it'll come in the mail. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to, you'll get the million dollar check, but you have to do the work. That's how the universe rewards, right? It, it, if you want to go down the Catholic route, it's God helps those who help themselves, right? Or the universe pays back, whatever you want to use, whatever bumper sticker you got, the universe recognizes the work and it puts it, it puts the, the carrot out and it also gives you the reward of that. And when you can realize like you did in that moment that like you're the author, the publishing company, the, the reader, you're the pages of the book, now you're able to create from that space rather than be in a reactive space where you're like, uh, and you're just kind of going through life. Yeah. It's like, hey, one moment, one second. no, no worries. Dog, cat. What do we got? Dog. Yeah. My dog was like, he's looking at me like dog, like bro. Let, like I need, like I need to go lay in the grass. Um, no, exactly. It, it, it's we, I think that, I think that it's very easy. It's very easy to, to forget how much power our mind has and our thoughts have. And I had a quote that I had said in a video that I shot with, a, um, with this videographer like about a month ago where I was just like, if we realize the power of a single thought, 
you know, we would change the way that we think. And it's like, think about like the, I have a dream speech by Martin Luther King. Like he was probably sitting in bed one day, just like, I have a dream, like, and, and, and look where it is. 60 years later, we're talking about this. That originated as a single thought. I'm going to go to the mall, Washington DC mall, and I'm going to give a speech that's going to change. A thought, a single thought. So it's like, we so, we so quickly and easily forget that every single thing that ever happened ever originated purely and simply as a single thought in a single person's mind that they were like, could it be a thing? And then if you want to go deep down the rabbit hole and you think about things like quantum physics, it's like a thought is a actual thing. A thought is, is actually, can, you can actually measure a thought being created in your mind. It's like an electrical signal that moves around your brain. So it's like, it literally, you're quite literally like manifesting an actual physical tangible thing by thinking about something. And it's like, if a thought can begin and originate at just that thing, much like a child originates with just a, like a couple of cells, it's like all things are, are all things come from just being able to recognize your own power and then having the discipline to stay on that and follow that track in times of adversity and in times of success. Well, that's the story of the alchemist, right? Invoking in within yourself what you already know, and and the end result. Spoiler alert: is that you are God, right? And and we we when you say that, it becomes blasphemic, and you, you know you, you're not this deity in the sky with a beard who tells you, you jerk off too much. It's it, you you are in in essence you are the universe, and you are able to tap into. I hate that term, but you are able to to you know achieve these things by your thoughts and your practice of your thoughts. And again, that's where people get tripped up because your thoughts have multiple voices, right? And you, one thought says, you got this, you could do this. And the other one says, you're a fucking idiot. What are you doing? But who is that you they're referring to? Who's saying you, because you are you. So you are, you are not your thoughts. You are the embodiment of these thoughts. And if you could put positive thoughts into practice, that's where results show themselves. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's, you're, you're, you're spot on with that and you're, you are absolutely in control of the way that you see the world and two things can be true at the same time. I love the example of like the lightning bolt. If I'm a mile away from a lightning bolt and you're three miles away, when that strikes is correct for you and not the same for me. And we're both right. And um, it's just that we, we are, we are divine and we are in control. And, and, you know, as much as we can't, save ourselves from a lightning strike or save ourselves from a tsunami there are certainly a lot of things that we can that we can control and having the discipline to understand that that how we make every decision minute to minute moment to moment what we think about what we intake what we output what we say what we say that we hear um is always affecting the next thing and it's like we all people some on a, i think i did a podcast the other day where he was like he's like how do you deal with you know, being down, like, do you have down days? And I'm like, of course, doesn't everybody. I've just gotten better as my life's gone on to try to keep as close to equilibrium as possible and know that when I go down, there's an up to follow that. It's like, everything is just this wave. It's like a, it's, it's energy. It's a, it's a, it's a vibration. So it's like every vibration, sound, whatever. It's like, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. So we know that's going to happen. It's just trying to stay closer to equilibrium and not have your swings be as violent. And also know that if you're at the bottom, you're about to go up. So it's like, how are you going to use what you learn at the bottom to accelerate up faster and stay up longer? It's like that, that recognition and that discipline comes along with knowing it, practicing it, having the drive, having the mental toughness, and then not allowing external things to cloud your vision so that you pass through those without learning. One thing that I used to do a lot is like, I would smoke a ton of weed and like, I'm not anti-weed. Like I would smoke weed again, but I just don't right now because when I went down, I would smoke my way through the down. And then when it came time to get back up again, I certainly couldn't go back up as high. And I didn't get all the lessons that I would have gotten from the down because I smoked my way through it. And it's like, it was just like, up. Blah, and you don't get all those lessons. And that's the thing is like when you're mentally sharp and you're kind of firing and connecting, those little things become clearer to see. And not only that, they happen faster. So that's why I've just been like chilling on the weed. And, and um, that among many things, I think is what kind of like kicks us off balance in our progress. Like we're snowballing forward um, if we can only recognize the significance of each of those thoughts.
Yeah, I, I want to go back a little bit to the quantum element of things because, again, it, it goes in line with, like, the secret idea. But, again, the, the, the quantum, and I, I think a bigger part of it truly is, is more about feeling, right? Like, yes, the thoughts are super important, and what you put out there in your mind, also, obviously, showing up for the discipline element of it, that's how it manifests. But I think a big part of it for me is feeling and writing out those feelings and recognize those feelings when they're showing up in other forms, like I referenced earlier. And when you're able to kind of matrix your emotions, right? Yeah, do you have down days? Of course, you know, the last moments of Jesus, what do you say? Like, you know, do I really have to do this shit? Like, this is what I have to do? But like, we all have Ram Das, you know, his last moments on earth, like, yes, still questioning everything. We all have our moments, but it's like you said, you know, recognizing that in those moments, there are such valuable lessons. And how do you rebound from that? Like I had two piss poor days the last two days, right? And I could have stayed on that trajectory and an older version of me would have ridden that out for a week. But now it's about how do I rebound knowing that this isn't as terrible as I could be and this isn't as great as I could be. I'm somewhere in between and I'm always fluctuating and it's getting that data and information and really being analytical about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's the thing is like, recognizing the downs and knowing that this is an opportunity to grow is crucial. Yeah. And then also, you know, recognizing that and then getting the information and the data from that and now applying it to the real world and applying it where it shows up. What are some other things, you know, other, obviously not smoking weed anymore, but what are some other things that you do or, you know, that are part of your ritual to kind of create that frame of mind? Well, one of the things that I've really leaned into in the last year is like being, being as conscious as possible as I can about, about what I spend time thinking about and what I do when I otherwise have nothing else productive to do, or I feel like I need to break from something. Like one of the things I started doing is on Saturdays, for example, if I wake up, I walk the dog, I have lunch or whatever else, and I don't have anything specifically to do. Typically, you'd think like, yeah, but I'll contact some buddies, I'll go meet up with some friends for one thing or the other. But when I have that downtime, I just go to the gym. That's the thing is like, I find I find that if I can, if I can move through this next two and a half hours of time, and be disciplined in my visitation to the gym and making that so habitual that it almost seems like I'm missing something when I don't go. Um, that's something that I've really been leaning a lot into lately. It's like, like, for example, it's like I have somewhere to be tonight at, at uh, 530. And I look at the clock and I'm like, all right, it's 2.30. It takes me 20 minutes to get to the gym. I got I to gotta give myself an hour and a half. So it's like prioritizing the gym and exercise has been something that I've been really leaning into a lot lately. Because it's like, if you make something in your mind like a non-negotiable, like I used to be able to negotiate my way out of it. Like, ah, like I, I went to the gym a lot this week. I'll take a day off, whatever. <laughs> right, like right, everybody right, does right. that. It's like making something a non-negotiable and fitting it in um, is really crucial. And that's been the thing that I've been leaning to a lot lately is just like making time for something that I know I need to do. Like I, I, I like a, a few, a few months back, I was thinking to myself, like, if I was the highest version of myself, this is something that I do often. If I was the highest version of myself, would I do this? Or right. what, or what would I do? And th it's like, if you, if you have a tough time executing on that belief, think of it more like this. If I had a billion dollars, what would I do? And it's like, well, I would have to go to the gym. I would probably prioritize the gym. Like, God, like I got all the money. It doesn't matter. I'll just make sure I exercise every day. Make sure I, you know, make sure I eat the breakfast that I want to eat or whatever. I would get a chef. So now it's like, there's Uber Eats. I have a chef. They'll drop, right. drop it right to my crib, right? I'll get up on Uber Eats and I'll be like, I'm gonna have a chef make me an acai bowl and a steak and eggs and I'm gonna order it and I'm gonna go walk the dog and then I'll use that time to do this. And it's like, instead of thinking about the extra money that that costs, I think about the time that it saves me. And it's like, this is what a billionaire does. A chef drops the food off. Oh, I'm gonna go work out in the middle of the day because I know it's a priority. That's what a billionaire would do. That's what my highest priority, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I try to think of it like that where it's just like, what would the highest version of myself do? And what I didn't realize years ago that is becoming more and more clear now is that it's not always about mega ultra grind all the time. Going to the gym 
for that extra hour might make my mood be a little higher. Maybe, maybe make my jokes hit a little sharper, maybe make me feel a little better. And then like in that time, I can mentally process what I'm going to talk about that day instead of just being like, I got to work, I got to grind it through. Um, so the, the balance of grind and humanness um, has been something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Yeah, because it emanates, right? If you're in a, if you're in a better position, you're pulling from you're, you're you're pouring from a full cup, right? If you're able to create your ultimate day, whatever it looks like, your version of an ultimate day, if mm -hmm. you're able to create that for yourself, then you're able to give out a different energetic frequency that's pulling from optimization and pulling from you know a, a full cup, rather than being like, I gotta hammer out these emails and answer this phone call, and, uh, right? So you're, you're pulling from abundance or scarcity. And when you're able to operate in that freedom space and you recognize, you know, the importance of your bandwidth, right? Bandwidth consumption, what you're going to use your, your mind, your body, your spirit on, you know, ultimately does it lead to the best version of me, my ultimate self. And I think that's such a powerful question, both to frame yourself in and be like, you know, what does my best day look like? What is the ultimate version of myself doing on the day to day? And you may not be able to do all of it, but if you can recreate some of it and then recreate the feelings of it, then you're more likely to step into it as time progresses. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's the other thing too, is just like you recognizing that comes from deep introspective thought. Like I didn't come to that conclusion by, I didn't like, I didn't see that somewhere necessarily. It was because I took the time to just think about it. Where do you think? Riding the bike, walking on the treadmill, going to the gym, lifting the weights, whatever. You're like tuning out all of the non, non pertinent information and you're taking time to think. Like yesterday, I just went to the beach, just took a nap. Just looked at the sky for a while. Was that oh. just was that just surely based off of your Instagram name, Take Naps? Was that just the whole? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, no. I need some content. I'll go nap on the beach. Yeah, I mean the 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 thing is is that I remember thinking to myself like a nap is the most luxurious thing that you could do. Like if like I imagine it's like if I had a like being in Fort Lauderdale where I live, it's like I see yachts all the time, and it's like imagine what you would do if you were on a yacht all day and you had nothing right. to do. It's like, you'd wake up, have breakfast, go for a swim, hit the jet ski, whatever. And then like, you just nap in the sun. It's like, you would just chill and you would live this luxurious kind of lifestyle and you would just do whatever you want. And um, that was the thing is like, sometimes it's important to take a nap if you're tired. Like one of the biggest things for me working from home is that I have, I don't have a regimented schedule. And it's like, if I'm real tired and I need to take a nap, I can go take a nap. And there's been many times, not a lot. It's not like I do it every day, but it's like, if I'm real, if I woke up early or I'm exhausted, I'll go in the other room and just nap on the couch for a few hours. And sometimes that's what you need. And it's like, when you deprive your body of that, because you got to work till five or you have your boss or whatever it is, it's like, it's not the most productive use of my human energy. And I remember when I used to work in an office every day, I'd be like, all I need is a nap for an hour. I could, I'll work till 10 PM. Like, just let me do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'll be so hyper productive. Like, I'm not willing to work hard. It's just the rigidity of this structure screws me up. And I remember my last job, the last job I ever had, I, my, I had talked with the boss and I, had, I lived right up the street. And a lot of my work, I'd literally walk in, be like, what up? Sit down, headphones on, build websites all day. I sometimes wouldn't even talk to anyone in the office. We're just, everyone's got headphones on. That's it. You go to lunch, you come back. Hey, man, did you see my email? Yeah, I saw your email. Okay, cool. I didn't even need to be there. And when I originally agreed to the job, I said to him, like, just don't make me come in at 9 a.m. Like, let me come in at 10. Let me come in at 11. I'll stay till 7. I'll stay till 8 o'clock at night. Whatever I got to do, just let me be free on the time. Don't, don't lock me. Because my previous job, I worked at a bank, and they fired me for showing up 10 minutes late. So I had been fired from a previous job for that exact reason. Um, so he hired me. So you, so you knew your weakness, right? You knew yeah. going into this that you knew that this was something that was not not in your wheelhouse, right? This yep. is not something I could perform on. Here are my, you know, here's the 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 situation that's in front of you. I'm willing to be, yeah, I'm willing right. to work hard and be productive. Let me do this. After three months, he was like, you know, you know, you, you got to be in here at nine. The other guys in the office are coming in at nine, and they're like, this new guy's flaunting the rules. I'm like, dog. Like, do you not remember hiring me based on this premise? So it was like, it was nine, then it was 9.05, then it was 9.15. And like, before long, it was just like, I just started to resent the fact that they were making me do that. And it's like, I was willing to work hard and, and, and 
it was just like those types of things where I'm like, I hate how I hate how you get into a zone and then they kind of like give you the Kool-Aid and then like they giveth, giveth, and then they just start to take it away. And that was the thing that really messed me up. It's like they had also promised that I was gonna get a three dollar raise after three months and another three dollar raise after six months. That's Here's your trip. pittance, your three dollars. Here yeah. are your three dollars, Bobby. Keep on coming to the same, you know what I mean? Like, here's your little carrot. Here it is, three dollars. And you're like, but, hi but hired on that premise. Hired right. On that no, listen, it may yeah. listen, uh, of course. And I'm with you. And 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 I subscribe to that too. And there is value and merit in that. But it's so like when you're on the other end of that, or even when you're in the middle of it and you recognize what's what's transpiring, you're like, like you're just giving me like like I'm just I'm you just give me a carrot like you're giving you're just dangling this carrot and and yes the, you know I'm giving you my time you're giving me compensation for my time but it's that lack of humanity where like where that gets so egregious there was a there was a yeah and then like after the three months they didn't give me the raise I got the three dollar raise at the six month mark after I'd been asking for it yeah. for months the next day literally the next day after I got the raise. Um, to where I should have been three months earlier. Um, I woke up late. It was a Friday. I'd stayed out the night before, woke up late, came in at 12, five. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, we got him. We got him. He's supposed to be making $6 more, but now we have a way to get rid of him completely, get someone yeah. that doesn't need the $3 and will conform to getting here at nine o'clock. Actually, they'll get here at 830 because yep. they're so scared of losing their jobs. Yeah. One time I was in the lunchroom or whatever, and I saw this document that they had given us that said, you earn, I think it was like two sick days after a year or something like that. And it was something to, along the lines of, or vacation days. And it was like, when you work for, when you work here for 10 years, <laughs> you get 10 days, something crazy like that. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I can't imagine being here nine years from now and thinking to myself, I have 10 days of my choosing in a calendar year. And I'm just like, this is bullshit. And like, I need to get out of this. And I remember the day that I got fired, I just, I said to myself, like, I'm never going to get a job again. And I will do anything to not have to work a job for the rest of my life. I told my buddies that I'm like, that's it. I'm done. Like, no, no more bosses ever. And um, that was, uh, geez, that was 13. That was 13 years ago. <laughs> 14. Yeah, but, but, but a lot of people would, you know, pull from a scarcity mindset, right? They got fired. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to freak out? You know, when I got let go from my day job uh, over the summer, um, I, I thought to myself, I was like, well, you know what? I could, I could freak out or I could say, okay, well, here's a new, here's a new challenge and opportunity. Yep. And what am I going to do with this new information? And I was like, I'm just going to lean into what the fuck I want to do. I'm going to lean into what I should be doing, what I feel what I want to be part of my every day and not just look for my carrot, right? Not just look for, and there's nothing wrong with any of, there's nothing wrong with working, like you said, you know, the conventional job, absolutely. But when you're working the conventional job and you're not leaning into it and it, and it rids you of your essence, that's where it becomes choppy. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's the thing is like, just like you said, you said it right there. It's like, you look at it, you look at it as a new opportunity. It's like one door closes, another door opens. Uh, you know, all the doors close and a window opens. I mean, there's there's always another way to navigate through these things. And that resilience to know that when those things happen, that you have another way. And that belief that no matter what you're going to do it, it's crucial. That's yeah. the mental toughness. That's the and, discipline. And you could read all the books and you could do all the psilocybin mushrooms and you could do, you know, <laughs> you could do any of all the things, but it boils down to actually knowing it within yourself. And, and you, like I said, you could read every self-help book, but unless you have that recognition. And for me, a lot of it is like silence, right? Like sensory deprivation, meditation, whatever it is. A lot of it is just kind of stillness and reflection and radical conversation with myself and, and stepping into that discomfort and saying, okay, there's a knowing here. There's a narrator here that isn't me. And then there's behind all of this noise, there's this, you know, this energetic field that kind of comes out. And if I could use that and have that, you know, have a tangible experience in this 3D reality, then I think I'm doing all right. I'll feel all right. Yep. Certainly. Um, I wanted to ask you, so you, the, the take nap things is surely just out of the idea of, of being luxurious. Pretty much. I mean, pr pretty much for the most part. I mean, I'm, I'm a, 
I'm a web developer by trade. I've been buying domain names and websites since 2003, I think was the first domain name that I registered. So I've been probably even before that. So I have a, I have an acute understanding of, or I have a, I have a deep understanding of words and how words affect memory. When I bought domain names, I always liked words that were like an action. I didn't like words that were like computerscreen.com, like a microphone.com. As much as those were valuable, I didn't feel that they had the same brand ability. They weren't as memorable. So I always liked actions. I also like I also like words that are short, succinct, and easy to spell because those things are memorable when it comes to the domain world. So when I was looking for a handle, I was just looking for different things around the word naps. It was like, I love naps, take a nap, go to take a nap, sleep, nap, whatever. Um, and I was just looking for handles. And as I typed in all these different ones to see which one was available, take just so happened to be there. I was like, take naps, short, memorable, two syllables. When it comes to domain names, syllables are a big thing. Take naps, two syllables. It's like, it's like the holy grail of domain names is something that has two syllables um, if you can't get one. So I was like, this is easy to spell. It's user universally recognizable. It's available. And it follows around my word of naps. And I was like, taking naps is luxurious. Cool. That seems cool. I never, there was no grand plan. It's like, right. I, there never is though. There never is like this big grand scheme of like, oh, I'm going to make it take naps. It sounds like this. It just kind of created itself. And I'm thinking like, yes, there is something. And we all have fallen asleep on the couch at two o'clock on a Sunday, woke up and be like, I need a bag of chips and a soda, right? You're just like that post nap feeling where you're coming out. You're like, what? what the fuck is going on right now? Did I miss the bus? You yeah. know, it, and, and there is something very humanizing about that, right? It's very relatable that like, yes, some people are pro nap, not pro nap, whatever it is, but naps are a thing that people like to experience to some degree. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, it's universal understanding. It's, it, it translates well. It's easy to remember. It's short. It's succinct. It's succinct. It's easy to spell. It's two syllables. And like, it was as simple as that. And like for the first, I created my account in, I don't even know, 2013, maybe the first 200 posts, it's like a tree, a branch, <laughs> my dog, you know, laying on the couch. Like, right. it's not like I came in with this, with this grand scheme. It was only till years later where I just like found myself on Instagram more. And I started making funny videos just because I was like, whatever, I'll like fire this off. I wanted my creativity to have some outlet. And interestingly enough, being at home and working for yourself, it takes away a social aspect of life because you're just grinding at the crib. And as much as I love it, it's like, I'm not buying coffee at the corner store. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Walking into the office. Hey, Jane, how, Joe, what's up with your weekend? Bing, bing. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have those social interactions. So waking up and just coming in here and sometimes being alone literally until five o'clock when I go to the gym or six o'clock is a normal occurrence. Like the only person I see is like the UPS guy, the FedEx guy. So finding a way to have someone interact with me and also let me, put some of that creativity out there was a way to create social interactions. It was like, I'm going to make a funny video. 10 people I haven't heard from from a while will message me. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? And like a social thing is created. So it, it was as much that as it was just venting the frustration and, and all of the things. And you also do a ton of merch, right? Yeah. I, I, people were beating my door down for merchandise. And I'm like, you know, I'm as an entrepreneur, I think all entrepreneurs, creative ones at least have a merch attempt. Everybody tries to do that. When I was mine's, like, hey, mine's in the works. Yeah, I made t-shirts <laughs> in high school. Look, I tried to do. I tried to sell t-shirts many, many times. It's like everyone needs a t-shirt. I can make a funny t-shirt, whatever. A lot of people try that. I think that it's a really challenging thing, and I've failed at it multiple times. Sold a few hundred, few hundred bucks, and then like it fizzles out because it's like I'm not a fashion designer. People were beating my door down for merch, and I'm like, man, like I don't know. And I was like, all right, well, my videos aren't making any money. People are asking me for it. Like, let me make a couple shirts. So I literally was like, big blue you know, Donnie doll game. And I made a couple of shirts, didn't really think much of them. And the orders were just like flying, ripping because people wanted to support the cause, but didn't know how. So the first month, the first month I got 10, 15 orders. I was like, wow, it actually brought in some money. Let me make some more. I dumped in some more merch. The next month I did 297 orders in one month. And it's like in this month, it just blew up. And I'm like, you know what? This is a, this could be a consistent revenue stream that will help support the channel. So instead of thinking it as like a, as like a fashion company, I just thought of it as another way for people to support the cause. So I like made the Joey dumpster fire. Like, <laughs> right. Who even care? Like it's like it's like a joke, but it just seemed to me like that was an easy way for people to get a reward for contributing to support the cause. So it's like it's not even about the merch. 
it's really just about like i support this and let me just have a funny shirt um, right who doesn't love a good t-shirt man it's like That's who doesn't love a good uh, just a good either free or a good like quality like hey this is or a funny t-shirt i i actually like stripped down half my wardrobe because i had like trunks worth of t-shirts that i never wore and I just went down to like basic gray and black t-shirts, but yeah. I had so many t-shirts. I remember I was going to Comic-Con. I was like, well, which, you know, which Star Wars t-shirt am I going to wear? Everyone loves a good t-shirt. And then you get someone like, hey, good t-shirt. You're like, yes, mission accomplished. Ego rewarded. Creates. It's the thing that's so cool about it is that it creates social interaction if done right. And, and just, I've gone to, a, I've gone, to, I've been to about 150 music festivals. I love music festivals. One of my favorite things to do. Because imagine, alone in the office all day to 150,000 people at a music sensory party. overload. It's like, hell yeah. Like people are like, just people just high five you to high five you. And as I go around the music festival, I would always laugh when I saw a shirt that just said some funny shit. It's like a, it's like a cat on a surfboard with like a, with like a torch that's on fire, like drinking a beer. Right. You're like, you're like that guy's bucks, you know, yeah. that guy's cool <laughs> tell. So it was like, people would, you would, you would just feel compelled to walk up to a person and be like, yo, that's the funniest shit I ever seen. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 and sometimes people would have signs. Like there was this one sign, this guy said like, uh, it was like, it was like, it was like, fuck real life. That's what it was. I went to, <laughs> I went yes. to this, I went to this festival in Michigan called Electric Forest. And this guy was walking around with a big red sign that just said, fuck real life. And hundreds, hundreds of people were coming up to this dude being like, yo, that's the funniest shit I've seen all day. Like, let me get a picture, let me get a picture. And it's like, we all have this innate desire to interact with each other. But a lot of the times we don't know how. So we're just looking for a way in, a yeah. stupid hat, a funny shirt, a way to create that humanness connection. And it's like, I think that that's in a lot of ways what this is. Like you wear a fucking face mask that says face diaper or this isn't helping or remember what air was like or whatever. And like, you just created a new interaction that probably otherwise wouldn't have been there. So what people are buying as much as they're supporting the channel is they're buying a social interaction that connects them to a person in another way. Like, yo, this guy, this dude gets it. Someone sees me in a Joey dumpster fire shirt. They either have no idea what that is or they really get it. And they're like, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's so specific. That's like, it, it's so specific. It's actually vague. Right. It's like, yes. because it's exactly to your point. It's like, what is that? Or, Oh yeah, yeah. I got that. I'm with it. Um, where can people connect with you? Where can people get your gear? Where can people find more of your information? So the website is bobbysauce.com. All of my links are in the footer on bobbysauce.com. That's the gear. That's where you can support the cause. Uh, my home base is Instagram at take naps on Instagram at take naps on parlor. And then I'm on, I'm on uh, Facebook and on YouTube at Bobby Sausalito. So facebook.com slash Bobby Sausalito, youtube.com slash Bobby Sausalito. And then Bobby sauce.com is the spot and take naps on the gram. Awesome, man. Bobby, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate your time. This is a lot of fun, dude. Yeah, dude, my pleasure. Absolutely. And thanks so much. Be sure to send me the link when it's up and, and we'll, uh, we'll get it popping. And I appreciate it. And also I always say, it's like, I appreciate everybody's precious time, the people that are willing to listen and watch and, and share it. And I, I appreciate it so much. So thanks. I had, a, I had a good time as well, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. All right, brother. I'll see you.